Let's get in the Word this morning. Is that okay with everybody? This has been uh, one of the, I think this is going to be one that's hard for me to preach today because it, it, I felt like the Lord was speaking to me the whole time I was preparing and getting ready for this message. Uh, Philippians ch- uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 14 through 16 is where we're going to be, but I think um, one of the most urgent questions that Christians have to ask today, especially in our age, in where we're living right now, um, really any age, but... How do we live as faithful believers in a non-Christian environment? How do we live as faithful followers of Christ in a non-Christian environment? Or how can we be faithful Christians or believers in a non-Christian world? Or even where we're at now in a post-Christian world. How can we be believers? How can we be faithful in this walk? Because there are so many times when our culture... um, is seems to be so far from God that it's that it's not even visible anymore, you know? Because there used to be a time, there was a time in our culture when when our when our culture was shaped more by Christian values than it is now. Right? It used to be a long time ago, so some of you may have grown up in that era where it was God first. You know, it was it was in God we trust. You know, people would say our Founding fathers were God-fearing, and well, you can say that if you want to, but do some history before you start talking about that too much. But there was this foundational truth of the values of the Word of God that our that our country was founded on. This being Memorial Day, I think it's appropriate to kind of talk about that. But where did that go? What happened? Because right now we find ourselves in this increasingly secularized environment. It's secular. Things are secular. How is it that we live faithfully as believers in that kind of environment, in the place that we're at right now? The passage we're looking at this morning, I think, gives an answer to that question. So we're in Philippians chapter 2, and uh, he's already encouraged them. We've, we've seen throughout the weeks. He's encouraged them uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, he's encouraged them. He's exhorted them. He's, in, he's given them all this praise for their faithfulness. He's, he's given them instruction. He's taught them well up to this point. I mean, in in chapter 1, he says to live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? He's given them this this challenge. This this is who we're supposed to be. And then last week, we looked at chapter 2, verse 12, where he says to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in us to will and to work for his good pleasure. So everything we do is to honor Jesus, is to bring honor to God, right? So that is kind of what Paul has been talking about. Then we come across the scripture we're going to be in today. It The commands, the exhortations, they continue, but now it's focused in a world that we live in and teaching us how to live in that world. That's That's what I'm meaning to say. He's trying to teach us how to live in a world that is not uh, really in step with the church, if you could say that. So it's really a focus on mission. It's a focus on the lifestyle that we're to have as believers, even though we're living in the middle of a non-Christian and non-Christian context. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. Uh, I'm going to read this, and I'm going to give some critical or some crucial realities about living as believers in a non-Christian world. So this is what Paul says. Do all things... This is the hard part for all of us, let's face it. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So here are some crucial thoughts living in a post-Christian world. The number one thought is this. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. First off, you have to, we have to remember our identity. Where do we get our identity at? You really get the identity piece in verse 15 when Paul calls the believers to whom he writes, children of God. He speaks this. He says this. And it means more than just face value. He gives them instructions. He gives them encouragement. But he gives them encouragement as children of God. And everything that he commands 
flows from that basic reality, that this is who they are. They are children of God. They are people of God. You are a child of God. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. That is who Paul is identifying the people as. So when we read this phrase in the scripture, it's important for us to realize that not everyone is a child of God. Not everyone is a child of God. So when Paul is speaking, he's not speaking to everybody. He's speaking to those that are belonging to Jesus. That's who he's talking to when he refers to children of God. It's true that everyone's created by God. Absolutely, people are created by God. And in, in that sense, we are his offspring, I guess, in, as uh, Acts 17 talks about. But when we find the language of children of God or child of God, sons and daughters of God, the family of God, that kind of language, when it's used in scriptures, is always referring to believers. It's always referring to us, okay? It's a language that describes those who belong belong in God's family. Now, if you remember in John chapter 1, the prologue of John's gospel, if you will, he says this, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, right? We've probably, if you've been in church for a long uh, extended period of time, you've probably heard that scripture before. Paul uses this language as well in Romans 8 when he says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We read this phrase, children of God, we have to remember All of God's love that comes behind that designation, that uh, appellation, to be called a child of God means that we are loved by God as our Father. That is what Paul is speaking here. He's, He's showing there's a depth to this idea of being children of God. In John, in 1 John chapter 3, there's this emphasis. There's this phrase, okay? Listen to this. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Now we look at this and go, okay, well, God, uh, God reveals himself to us in his word and that kind of thing. Absolutely, but we will never be able to see God as he is this side of heaven. If you remember Moses, Moses asked to see God, and God, God said, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I will walk past you, and all you will see is the backside of me. You won't even see me, and what happened to Moses? He, he shines brightly, right? And, and he had to put a veil over his face to cover the, the brilliance of God that was radiating from him. That was just seeing him pass by. To fully see God is not possible until we get in his presence for eternity. So, When it says that we will be made like Christ and we will be like him when we see him as he is, that hope leads to a certain kind of lifestyle. 1 John 3, 3. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself even as he is pure. All of that is packed in this little phrase, children of God. This little phrase. So the very first thing Paul does is remind the Philippian believers, and he reminds us today of our basic identity, that we belong to a new family, that we have a new father, that we have God as our father, Christ as our brother, and the spirit indwelling our hearts. He's reminding us of this. All of that leads to a certain kind of lifestyle. So when Paul says, remember who you are, He's also telling us to live a certain kind of way because of our identity. It's the same thing as he said in the, in the first chapter when he says live lives worthy of the gospel. When you're living a life worthy of the gospel, that means people either see Jesus in you or don't. That's the way it goes. Do people see Christ in you or do they not see Christ in you? Do they see 
the world in you or do they see Jesus in you? It flows out of identity. It's an important biblical principle because our behavior flows out of identity. Our behavior comes from our identity. If I identify as Christ, I'm going to behave like Christ. I'm going to behave in that reflection. I'm not going to come after somebody. I'm not going to complain or or go crazy against somebody because Christ wouldn't do that, right? So there's this, that's just an example, by the way. I'm not saying I've done that lately. I'm telling you, the grumbling and complaining thing, when I read that, I went, Lord, I don't want to preach this this week. I just don't want to. Have you ever seen The Lion King? Too many times, The Lion King. Great movie, huh? You, which one do you like better? I, I got to ask, the, the cartoon or the real one? The original. The original, yeah. The, this young generation are like, what, what original? <laughs> Isn't it the one where they're like actually walking and stuff? No, there's a cartoon out there that have, you know, that's what we grew up on. So the Lion King, a lot of things about the Lion King that, that I don't think are that great. But it does serve a good illustration and Simba has to remember his basic identity. Remember Simba? Everybody remember Simba? I'm talking to the older people in the room right now. <laughs> Simba. Simba has to remember his basic identity. That he's the son of a king. And it's when he, it's when he recalls his identity, he recovers his identity. And that is when he be, begins to behave like a king. It isn't until he figures out and remembers who he is that he starts to behave like the person that he is called to be. It's not until he sees that. So if we don't understand that our identity is is in Christ, we're not going to behave like Christ. But once we grab a hold of the identity that we have in him, our behavior will begin to change. And we will be able to identify with Christ in our life. The same is true for our lives. When we remember who we are, it leads to a certain lifestyle. And Paul describes that lifestyle both negatively and positively. Negatively, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. That's the hard one, right? Grumbling carries the idea of complaining or murmuring or muttering under one's breath. It's the, it's the, it's the one who walks away blah, 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 doing like that because they, they're upset about it. It's the emotional discontent that gets expressed through words. Disputing carries the idea of intellectual questioning or doubting. Paul is probably thinking here of the generation of Israelites. If you think about it, the children of Israel who were redeemed out of Egypt. And they are in the wilderness They are complaining and griping and murmuring to such a degree that they test God and God expresses his displeasure by sending a plague among them. He's he's tired of it. Paul is essentially saying, don't be like that. Don't murmur and don't complain. Now listen, I know none of us are Jesus in this room. It is hard to do everything without complaining and murmuring. Right? Right? Even the, even the holiest of people gripe and complain. Many years ago, there was this monk, right? This monk, he, would, he decides to go into monkhood. I guess that's what they would call it. <laughs> Priesthood, monkhood, something. And so he goes to this monastery. monastery. Is that right? Monastery, is that where a monk would go? Yeah, I've never been a monk, so I don't know. <laughs> so they go, they go, he goes to this monastery, and the rules are, You can't talk. You can't say anything for 10 years. After 10 years, you can go to the leader of the monastery and you can can air, uh, uh, you can have a conversation with them, right? So he goes for 10 years and his 10 years are up and he's sitting with a supervising monk and the guy looks at him and says, is there anything in your heart? And the guy looks at him and he goes, food bad. And then he goes back for another 10 years of silence. 10 years go by. Silence. He goes to the supervisor again after another 10 years. It's been 20 years, right? 
goes to the supervisor again, goes to him, and the supervisor says, what, what would you like to get off your chest? And he looks at him, and he goes, bed hard. Then he goes back for another 10 years, right? And so 10 years goes by. This is 30 years this guy's been in this thing, right? On the third time, the 30 years go by, he goes to the, 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 the head monk, and he looks at him, and he says, you got anything you'd like to say, uh, you know, during this time? And he looks at him, and he goes, I quit. <laughs> and the supervising monk looks at him, and he goes, I kind of thought that was coming because all you've done is complain for 30 years. <laughs> because that's what we do, right? Even the smallest little things, we have this complaining nature. Unfortunately, that's sometimes true in the Christian life. Where we complain, we complain, we complain, we murmur, and we mutter, and we do that all over again. And we keep doing it, and keep doing it. Paul is saying, don't do that. Don't. Because it doesn't fit who you are as the children of God. I think also when you look at the whole context, don't do that because it tarnishes your witness as believers. That has been my biggest, I think, conviction that I've had and something I've been working on, just to be honest with you, been working on for a long time, is the complaining and the negativity aspect of things. Because here's what I like to say. I like to say, I'm not negative. I'm a, I'm a realist. I'm just going to be real with you. That is stupid. But others see that as, he's just so negative. But in my brain, I'm going, no, I'm just real. I'm just going to be real with you. I don't like that. That does not look good. But here's the thing. You can do that kind of thing if you do it the right way and you do it in an honoring type way that is not complaining in a malicious way. You see what I'm saying? There are ways, but here's the thing. What Paul is saying is don't spend your life complaining and murmuring and griping about every little thing because here's the deal. There are so much more important things to worry about. Living your life worthy of the gospel, preaching the gospel, standing up for the gospel that you believe in. You want to die for this? Then complaining is not going to help your spirit when it comes to that. That's, that's so important for us to realize. We are not... To spend our lives complaining and murmuring. So that really hit me hard. And then I looked at the word blameless and just wanted to walk away. Blameless means to be without reproach. I would like to be without approach sometimes. But it has to do with a Christian's relationship to the world. Paul's, Paul finds this important, this whole relationship with the world. We have to have a relationship with the world. If we don't have a relationship with the world, who are we winning to Christ? Is your only friends Christians? Stop. Because what we end up doing is forming a country club, and we, we're, we're shunning everybody out that's not like us. Jesus hung out with tax collectors. Jesus did that kind of thing. He didn't conform to the way they were living, but he spent time with them. Why? For the sole purpose of winning them to salvation. When you look at this, and it says the word blameless, without reproach, we may be persecuted by the world, we may be criticized by the world, we may try to say negative things, or they may try to say negative things about us, and a lot of times they will, I promise you, it's going to happen, and it's happening right now, but there should never be a moral thing that they can say about us that would stick. We should be without reproach and blameless. Doesn't mean you're perfect. It's like when Paul calls us saints in the first chapter, and everybody looks at it like, what? what? We're not saints, but you are. Saints of God. It doesn't mean perfection. It means you're set apart. The word innocent has to do with the internal purity. So when Paul talks about innocence, there's an internal purity that we must have. It's not saying you're going to do everything right, that we're going to be perfect. It just means that internal purity is there, that striving to know Jesus. It's the word that we use to, to describe undiluted wine or metal without alloy. You've seen alloy wheels, that kind of thing. So that's what the purity is. It means that which is pure, that which is sincere. This has to do with the Christian as he knows himself to be. These are heart-searching words that cause us to look inside and to ask, are we really true to our confession and to our convictions? 
In other words, I think C.S. Lewis said it once. He said, the greatest test of a man's character is to know what he does when no one else is looking. That's the greatest test of our character. Because that's where we, let's, not, let's be honest, that's where we probably mess up the most. When nobody's looking. Nobody can see me, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that, or whatever, whatever it may be. But that is the greatest test of where we're at in our purity of heart. What's going on when nobody's looking? Will, will, I get, will I get honored for this if I do this little thing? Well, I'm going to make sure that everybody knows that I did this. So that, but that's not purity of heart. That's not what, that's not, actually, that's not even true servanthood. So when you're looking at what he's talking about, he's talking about these things that we do when no one's looking. He's talking about the internal purity that we have. Now, if you look at the phrase without blemish, how many of you are without blemish? Good. I was, I was like, what am I going to do if somebody raises their hand? I might be in trouble. Awesome. Prove it. It was a phrase that, we used, that was used of sacrificial lambs that would be offered to God. If you look at the Old Testament, you see this. Remember, they couldn't offer a lamb that had any defect. Any defected lamb they couldn't offer. No lamb with a broke leg, no, no lamb with a blind eye, nothing like that. It had to be spotless. It had to be without blemish. That's the idea here. That's impossible for us. We're all messed up. True. But that describes who the Christian is to be in relation to God. We are to be presented before him as without blemish. Now, understand, if you go back to those words of David and, and that time when Samuel uh, anointed uh, Jesse's sons as king or was trying to find uh, one of his sons to anoint as king and he saw David, remember what God said. God said, God, a uh, man looks at the outward appearance, I look at the heart. We're all jacked up. We're all messed up because we're human. But the fact of the matter is, when we stand before God, God's going to be looking at our heart. And where was our heart at? Where was the purity of our heart? Was it without blemish? Meaning, was I striving to get closer and closer and closer to him? Or was I just have one foot in the world and one foot in the church? Where was I at? It flows out of who we are. It describes holiness. When you put these three words together, it's the character of, of a Christian, of a believer. It flows out of the identity of who we are. I think about my daughters. I know every time I say that, my oldest probably has a lump in her throat because she's like, what am I going to say? I'm not going to say anything about you. Hi. She waved at me like that. When I think about my daughters who have my DNA. So there are similarities in their appearance to mine. They're good looking. <laughs> they will always, they will always have identity with me because I'm their dad. Always, right? There are similar family traits and features that come from both myself and my wife. All right? Both of them. Both traits that come. They are traits that carry from family to family, parent to child. We all have them. If you have kids, you have, you have that going on, right? That should be the Christian life as well. The traits and features we have should show the identity in Christ, right? We are called to look like our Father. Everybody with me so far? We are called to look like our Father. We are children of God. So remember who you are. Remember your identity. That's the first thing. The second thing is remember where you are. Remember where you are. Look how Paul words this. Verse 14 and 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. That's how Paul describes their contact. Context, And it's actually a phrase that comes from the Old Testament. In fact, it comes from that story of the first generation of Israelites. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, because of their fate unfaithfulness, because of their idolatry, and everything else that was going on, this is what it says in Deuteronomy. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. 
They are a crooked and twisted generation. Paul is saying, don't be like that. Don't be like those original Israelites who were crooked and twisted. Instead, you are to be without spot. You are to be blameless. You are to be innocent in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Now, here's interesting parts right here. That word crooked is the Greek word skolios. Anybody know where that comes from? Know where our medical term comes from? Scoliosis, right? Which, of course, is a medical problem of a, the curvature of the spine. Some, some of you may have that. You may suffer with that. It's a word that literally means to be curved or to be twisted or to be crooked. The second word, twisted, that we see here means to be perverse. In the original language, it means to be perverse. It carries the idea of deviation from that which is good, that which is moral, and that which is right. So when you see what's going on in our society today, do you see a crooked and twisted generation like Paul was speaking of? Now look, we look at it and go, well, that's just calling them names. No, it's not calling them names. It's looking at this right here. We live in a perverse world right now. Everything is, be, because, is being perverted especially when it comes to the church and biblical things, being perverted. They're perverting the gospel. Even so-called Christian churches are perverting the gospel in certain ways. And we got to be careful with that. And so what Paul was saying is, he's saying, no, you got to deviate away from those things. you got to go away from those things. This is how Paul describes the context in which we live. He describes the world in these terms. And in fact, he uses the word world in the next phrases. He says, you are to shine as lights in the world. So you are to be spotless, blameless, innocent in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. You are to shine as lights in the world. And the only way to do that is to live a life worthy of the gospel. It's the only way we can do it. And when he says world, he's talking about a fallen world system. We know this. He's not thinking about created earth, all that kind of thing. So you remember when um, Satan was described. In 2 Corinthians, he's described as the God of this world. Well, the Apostle John says that the whole world lies in the hands of the wicked one. These are verses that tell us that we are called to be different. We're called to be different. We are called to be distinct. When we look at people, or when people look at us, we should seem different from the world around us. We're not the same. If we start looking like the world, we start becoming the world. And when we start becoming the world, we lose our, we lose our witness. We lose the power we have in the gospel. We inhabit a world that is dark and is sinful and is twisted and perverse and that does not value the God uh, or what God values. When you live in a world that calls good evil and evil good, light darkness and darkness light, right and wrong, upside down and mixed up, when you live in a world like that and you try to hold on to the values of Christianity, when you try to live in a world or live in the way of Jesus, it's going to lead to some degree of animosity and sometimes even persecution. Be ready for it. Be okay with it. To be a friend of the world is to be at separation, enmity with God. The book of James says. So remember your identity and remember where you are. The last thing, I'm going to go fast. Remember your calling. Remember your calling. Here we come to the mission itself. What are we called to be and to do? We already have a piece of it. As Paul has described, the character we have or we are to have. But now he uses a vivid metaphor when he explains the metaphor. The metaphor is at the end of verse 15. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. The way in which a shine we shine as lights in the world is this. Verse 16. Holding fast to the word of life. You probably saw the story of the missionaries who were killed this past week in Haiti. Sad story. Two missionaries, husband and wife, been married less than a year, about a year, and uh, 
gang violence comes in in, in Haiti as they were leaving a church service and slaughtered them, killed them. So those two and then one other guy in their missions organization were killed. They, man, living a life worthy of the gospel takes a new turn. And you look at that, and that's why it's so important. That's why we talk about missions. That's why it's so important to understand missionaries, the importance of missionaries. They're doing things around the world that we're not. But if it comes here, can we handle that? I'm not saying we need to be okay with it or, or welcome it. We want that. We don't want persecution. But if it comes, we have to be strong enough to handle it. We have to be ready for it. There are a lot of passages in Scripture that describe us as light. And I think about these missionaries that were light to a world that was full of darkness over there. They were winning people to Jesus. They were telling people about Jesus, and they gave their life for it, literally. Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Here's a description of Christianity. Who should be living for the sake of Jesus Christ in a witness in a dark world? I think it's important to remember the fourth thing. This is it. To remember our destiny. All this is adding up to what God has called us to do. What our destiny is. The day of Christ in verse 16. In chapter 1, verse 6, it says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He's looking forward. He's looking to that day when Jesus returns in glory, when he stands, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we give an account of our lives as believers. A day when we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm ready for that day. I'm looking forward to that day. We have to remember our destiny. Look where we're going. Paul prays that very, that very thing for the Philippians in chapter 1. He says that love, he's praying that their love may abound more and more with all knowledge and discernment so that you may prove or may approve what is excellent. And get this, and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So let's put it all together. How do you live as a faithful Christian in a non-Christian world? You remember your identity. You remember who you are. You remember your context, which is where you are. You remember your mission, your calling to shine as lights in a dark world and hold fast to the word of life. And you remember your destiny. That There's a finish line right there. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Remember the goal, remember where you're headed. Be motivated by the gospel. Be willing to stand up for the gospel. And I promise you, the power of God will help us. Help us walk through it. So Heavenly Father, I just come before you today. And Jesus, I just ask you, Lord, just like every week, simplest prayer we can play, God help us. Just help. Lord, we need your help. Help us to be lights in a dark world. But God, help us not be Help us not be people that are so consumed with ourselves that we can't see others. Help us not to gripe and complain and grumble. Help us not to do that. But help us live a life that's pure and holy. Lord, I pray for every person here today. I pray for those graduates today, Lord, those that are graduating in just a few hours this afternoon. Lord, I pray blessing on them. God, as they start this new chapter in their life, Lord, I just pray that you'll be with them today. Be with their parents. As some of them may sob during this time. Be with them. Bring joy to their life. Lord, we give you honor and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. amen.